All right, welcome everybody to our webinar today entitled Nonprofits Need Research Too, which is true. Um, we've had, we've been very fortunate to be able to work with a couple of nonprofits this year that brought this topic to light. And we, it's our holiday gift to the community to be able to share what we've learned and how organizations with any budget, nonprofit or profit, can make sure to keep qualitative insights and market research in the mix. So my name is Katrina Noel. I'm the president of No Research. Hi, I'm Sonia. I'm a research assistant at No Research. And hi, I'm Leanne Donovan. I am the marketing manager and also a moderator for No, no Research. So you've got all three of us here on deck today uh, to walk you through um, a few points. Um, we're just going to tell you a little bit about why us, why we're the ones talking to you guys about the topic. We're going to start off then with a case study on our pro bono uh, project in 2019 and the recipient of that work and a little bit you to use that material as a case study to talk about how non research how um, non Profits can use research in a number of different methodologies to help their uh, their companies. Then we're going to talk a little bit about whether you're a nonprofit or not, and you have budget constraints. Don't worry, research is possible, and we're going to walk through some tips and tricks uh, to help make sure research stays in the mix. So that's where we're headed. To start off with, why us? Um, so in case you're not um, aware or familiar with No Research, we are a full service insights consultancy. Um, we primarily um, do most of our projects on a completely custom research design basis based on the needs of the organization. And we've introduced ourselves a little while ago, um, but we're really, um, everyone on the team is very much a boots on the ground team of experts who we do all of our own field work. We do a lot of our own um, recruiting, um, all of our logistics management and setup to really make sure that we are a trusted advisor for our clients to be able to fill the gaps in their knowledge um, on their key target audiences. And we really value a collaborative approach. That's part of the reason we're all here today as well, to kind of collaborate with the community in general, um, in a wider community, um, to talk about getting deliverable, getting valuable insights delivered, whether we happen to be doing it or not. <laughs> so that's a little bit about the power of no. Um, we have a number of different methods. You know, this isn't supposed to be a um, any kind of pitch for us. Uh, the reason we're highlighting them here is to really understand how you as an organization can engage, dig deeper, and take action based on, based on insights, and that there's a lot of options and a lot of methods at your disposal. We are going to talk about a curated set of these that are kind of the, the first ones to consider, but we also encourage you to reach out if you have any questions about any methodologies out there, there um, if you have any objectives that you're interested in um, finding the best approach for. We're very open um, and willing for that conversation. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about why we're talking about nonprofits. So we do, as a company, make it a priority to give back to the community. We do this um, on an annual basis in a couple of different ways. Um, we do do kind of a traditional monetary donation annually um, to uh, Avon Purple Purse, which is um, an amazing nonprofit that you may have seen on the sign-in sheet um, to contribute yourself, um, but we that is our personal benefactor on an annual basis. We do a lot of um, work with other nonprofit organizations um, in sort of in and without, in and not in the industry. So we do some work with the IACIC, we do some work with WeBank, with Smana, who are other nonprofit organizations that have businesses who are members of those organizations that benefit by research. So we partner with them to really make sure that research is being done at critical stages in new businesses. <laughs> Um, and then lastly, um, we have an annual offsite during which uh, we have a heated competition and rounds of voting to choose our non uh, our nonprofit organization that is the benefactor of our annual pro bono project. So everyone on the team brings a nominee and um, we talk about you know what the organization wants to learn how, if we're the best company suited to helping them through that journey and um, then we we run through the project with them which ends up being a lovely case study to share with you today so um here to talk about her pick in um, <laughs> in the contest leanne you want to kick us off and talk us a little through um our 2019 recipient absolutely so um 
My nominee that I brought uh, to the offsite this year was uh, for Lisa's Care Connection. Um, this is an organization that was started by Lisa Gibbons. Uh, you may have heard of her. She uh, has, she's been in, in the public eye for many years and has hosted various shows. She had her own show at one point, but um, when I met her, it was about 18 years ago when I first came to LA, she was one of the very first people I met. Uh, she, um, one of my best friends was her hair person on the TV show Extra. And one of the first things he said, hey, do you want to uh, do a walk-a-thon with me? And I said, Abs sure, I want to meet people. And I really hadn't seen much of the city yet. So I get there and I'm in Lisa's group. So we spent the day um, walking to raise money for Alzheimer's research. And I learned a little bit about her, got to know her, got to get to know her a little bit. And then through the years, I would see her at various parties or get togethers. And um, I knew that she had an organization uh, that that she had started for caregivers and their family members um, to help them with their loved ones who may need care and in the caregiving sense. So um, she started Lisa's Care Connection and it's a nonprofit um, with their mission that is to help families cope through tips, strategies and support. Their vision uh, was is to reset the caregiving conversation and their goal is to create an atmosphere of encouragement and empowerment, allowing <laughs> caregivers to flourish and thrive as they call on their courage and summon their strength, creating better outcomes for the person being cared for and for the caregiver themselves as they also learn how to maintain their own, uh, their own way in life while caring for someone that they love. So um, this is what they do and I felt very, uh, pulled to uh, to choose Lisa because my mother had um, Alzheimer's and I went through that journey with her. So this is something that was very near and dear to my heart and they won. So uh, I was very excited to be able to help them. Um, and if, Katrina, if you'd like to go to the next slide, I can tell them a little bit about what they wanted to work on. So um, when we told them that they won, they were very excited and they wanted to, they tried to figure out what it was they wanted to do. Well, they have a program that trains volunteers. They are all former caregivers who have walked this journey uh, of caregiving. And so they created a, a program that allowed these caregivers to become ambassadors. So they were available um, for others that were just starting that journey to share their wisdom and, um, and just to have be a shoulder to cry on if they needed it. So the hugs is helping you grow strong. That's the name of their, their um, project. And this was what we worked on. If you want to go to the next one. Yep. So what they, what they wanted to know, they had a few things that we needed to, to, to determine. Um, first of all, we wanted to determine what their unique benefits were for the hugs program. Um, and if we, once we did this, this would help clarify their positioning for communication and messaging and outreach that they wanted to do. But first they needed to determine one awareness. They were not really sure how many people even within the organization were aware of it. Um, volunteer satisfaction levels. They felt that this would be something that would be really important to find out really what were the, what were their volunteers thinking and feeling and some of their differentiators of the program. So, um, we decided when we took this on that we were gonna come at this from a few different angles. And so we developed a multi-phase approach, which Sonia is gonna tell you a little bit about. Awesome, thanks Leanne. So our multi-phase approach was made up of three steps and this really allowed us to build upon the learnings from the previous phase and also give us a 360 degree view of hugs, you know, relative to its competitors as well as helping them understand program satisfaction and understanding the impact of the program. Um, and all of these learnings help us um, or help hugs really um, expand and reach more people in the community who could really use it. So starting out with phase one, we did a competitive set review. So this was a publicly, like a review of publicly available secondary data, which allowed us to understand hugs vis-a-vis um, -vis its competitors. And we worked with Lisa's to um, understand 
who hugs competitors are um and they were able to use their expertise and tell us like hey you know you're on the right track or um you're missing something and this was really important in this phase because they have the subject matter knowledge and we relied on their expertise to make sure um what we're seeing made sense and this leads us to phase two which is the survey and we administered a survey to members of Lisa's Care Connection, both those who are involved with HUGS and those who are not, um, to help us really understand, you know, are people aware of HUGS and of those who are aware of it and involved, you know, how are they liking it? Um, are they satisfied with the program? Um, and this helps us understand what makes HUGS unique, valuable, and or attractive. And working with Lisa's, um, they helped us out by sending out the email invitations to everyone in their database. And this was really important um, to get the participants um, involved with the survey. And um, with this, you know, they knew the program director and it helped for, it helped us that she was able to um, reach out to those in the community who already knew her um, versus us who they didn't know. And with the survey, it helped us, you know, reach as many people as possible to get some numbers around um, what we were seeing already. And the last phase was the interview phase. And we actually found participants for this phase from the survey. So we built in kind of an opt in at the end of the survey that says like, hey, if you are interested in participating in more research, um, click yes or no. So we started out with reaching out to those that opted in um, to do these 10 interviews with them. So they were one hour each and they were done via webcam or on the phone. And we really dove deep into each participant's experiences with hugs, um, if they were involved with hugs. And if they weren't, um, we asked them other questions about, you know, appeal as well as like their own experiences and if they would be open to a program like hugs. And at the end of, I guess, all the phases, we, you know, analyzed the data and we put together reports and shared it with Lisa's care connection. And so the results um, were pretty, pretty amazing, honestly. Uh, we realized that HUGS is truly a one of a kind caregiving program. There's nothing else like it. Uh, they're truly unique. This uh, psychosocial aspect of the, the program is what sets them apart. But most importantly, it's a human-centered approach to caregiving, and there's um, an emphasis on caring, listening, and providing comfort. That is the heart of their program. Once we realized all of this and discovered it for them, um, it really helped them determine a clear way to get their, their message across and, and also inform them different areas to go down and, and different avenues and organizations to look at to reach a broader audience that would create a bigger, uh, more expansive opportunity for their volunteers and their donor um, expansion. So uh, through this, they, they really, we really did discover a lot of really great insights for them. Um, one of the things that was um, a little different that we did for them, we did do a competitive set report, we did a, a full report, and then um, we put together a video for their uh, their donor benefit that they had in November. And Sonia, Sonia did a great job putting it together for us, and we want to show you a little bit about that. And Sonia, you can talk a little bit about the report. Sure. Thanks. So this video um, was a great thing to come out of the research. And typically when we work with clients, we do a report usually in PowerPoint format. And for Lisa's, we put together um, a bunch of the interviews um, into a video format to really showcase the impact of the HUGS program and bring to life the experiences of those touched by it. Um, and like Leanne mentioned, it was played at the annual donor event. And if you're interested in the full version, we will have it available, but this is the short version.
In the fall of 2019, No Research worked with Lisa's Care Connection to interview members of its community. Participants were asked questions about their experience caregiving, the HUGS program, and Lisa's Care Connection. This is what we learned. I get a lot out of being in the support group that I co-lead. Um, I, I mentioned we're called Coffee and Canvas, so it's a, it's a creative art group. and um, We have people that come that have no art, art background whatsoever. They just want to come to a group that is not preaching at them or teaching them how to do this and how to do that. They just want to come. So we have one rule in our classroom, and that is what is said in the classroom stays in the classroom. You're free to say whatever you want to say. And some people come and they just want to tell their story and have somebody listen and hug them and cry with them and tell them that we're all survivors of one thing or another or, or we're trying to be. And you don't have to paint and be in the group. You can just come in here and feel the companionship of other people who know or can identify with what what walk you're on and and we're here and we care it's a very good good thing to let people give them permission to cry after probably about the second session people will stay there and admit their emotions and not not hide them there's a real release with tears knowing that you've got somebody there to grab your hand or to stay after the class is over. People bond that way. There's always somebody that's gonna be there to help. And of course, we are a huggable uh, group and sometimes that's all a person needs is a, a hug and say we care. Um, that there is a longer video. I do warn you, if you do watch the longer one, do not be ashamed if you tear up a little bit at the longer version of the video, but it was just such a complete treat to be able to work with the organization and to get those kinds of insights. And we heard back about the donor event that happened a couple weeks ago um, and it went really well. And so we're just so glad to support that kind of organization. But really the other thing to take away from this case study is that they were not a huge robust it financially backed institution with a bunch of big donors. This was, this kind of feedback, this kind of insights can be, can be done, can be facilitated on a smaller budget. So regardless of what kind of budget you're working with, there are ways, there are approaches, there are hacks um, to be able to do research even on the tightest, smallest budget. So we kind of want to transition a little bit from the case study, um, which hopefully was a little bit inspiring about how much the organization could do towards um, what anyone can do to get this kind of insights for their own organization. Um, and one of the things that we really think is most applicable to this particular audience is the fact that you have the benefit of having engaged resources. I think a lot of our for-profit companies and partners would, would really are quite jealous of sometimes the uh, numbers, the, the populations and the different engaged audiences that uh, nonprofits do have access to. So, so think a little bit about your internal team, you know, those who are working on the programs, those who are in contact with donors and volunteers, what kind of skills they have, if they have any, um, any kind of market research or interviewing skills or analysis skills in their background, all of that can be, um, can be used when running kind of these projects internally. And thinking about those engaged audiences. So we've mentioned donors, we've mentioned volunteers, ambassadors, past program members, members in the community, Often a lot of our nonprofit clients have um, community partners that can be very helpful um, in spreading the word about research opportunities. Um, so keep them in mind as well. Um, and you have platforms and tools. 
Um, and I think people think, well, we don't have any research tools in house, but you probably have some tools that can be re used for research in house. Um, like uh, the ladies mentioned when, um, when Lisa and her team reached out to uh, their constituents, that was an email list. Right. Um, there's other things you can use, like doodle polls, and Sony will talk a little bit about that later. Or you know, some some very simple tools that you have. If you have any kind of tool like this, like Zoom, there you go. You have a webcam interviewing platform. So I think it's really thinking about what you have in other areas of the business that you can leverage for research um, engagement. And think about where the budget comes for this. So I think you know this is of course a concern of all nonprofit organizations, but this could be to facilitate learnings to help your marketing team, to help a business development team, to help a community outreach team. So think about where the grants are, what they've been budgeted or earmarked for. We actually worked directly with the grant writer for Lisa's Care Connections as a part of the project to make sure that she got what she needed to renew those applications and to create the new grant applications. And that was a very important part of the setup of the project to make sure that not only did they get those beautiful videos and heartwarming findings, but that she also had what she had to be able to keep that budget strong for the organization for the next year. So it's good to keep in mind as well. I'm going to take over and talk a little bit about object objectives. And I know you're probably all wondering, why is this a slide with a woman on a kind of a cliff overlooking a foggy forest? Well, uh, a lot of times uh, nonprofit organizations or even small businesses that don't have a large budget finally say, okay, we have a little bit of money and we want to do research. All of a sudden, wow, they want to do everything because they know that this is their shot at getting some findings on anything or everything and they think i want to do it all unfortunately that's not um realistic so it may seem like all of a sudden you've got this wide open space in front of you but it's kind of a foggy forest because now you don't know where to turn we often times will help our clients determine you know really wheedle it down to what it is they want to know Therefore, we want to say to you, decide what it is you want to achieve or learn. Talk to your team. Um, talk to your board members. What, what is most important to you? Choose what's most important. And that's how you're going to determine what it is that you really want to find. When we worked with the uh, Lisa's Care Connection, we thought that this would be something uh, on a grander scale for Lisa's Care Connection. And then the more we talked to them, the more they realized they thought they threw out some ideas and all of a sudden, well, we've got this program and we're not sure what to do with it. That was it. It was like, okay, now we have, we have the basis for what it is you want to know. And from here we can funnel it in and really lock it down. So that's why it's so important. I know you have this, a lot of things running through your head. We want to know this and this and this, but what's most important? It, it, use your team, use outside, uh, any, any outside people that may be able to help you think about what it is that you think that they need, they want to hear or what you need to know. Yep. Exactly. And part of that is knowing your audience. Right, so you need to know what you need to know, but then you also need to know who you need to know it from. <laughs> yes, that's the name of our company, but that was a lot of no's in a sentence. But basically, um, the, the gist here is, who are you targeting? And then maybe who else could you be targeting, right? So you kind of have this easy in of, if we're talking about a program run by a nonprofit, we probably wanna to talk to the participants in the program probably be a good idea to talk about the volunteers or the staff that runs the program. And that's kind of, um, I'm not sure which is the more obvious shoe here, but apparently that is the more obvious point shoe. Um, <laughs> and then think about who else, what other audiences are part of the mix that are important to, whose feedback is important to have in the mix. So I think this was really crucial, especially in the, in the case study where there was a community partner or a hospital partner. There were people that were involved with the organization, um, and we wanted to make sure that they were both captured in the survey, in the quantitative measure, and also had a representative representation in the interview portion. So think about everyone that touches the issue. So once you've kind of stepped off that foggy cliff and you have your direction, you know, if we're going to use this project well, we're going to hone in on this objective. 
who are the audiences that impact that topic or that objective? And how can you find ways to speak to them? And I think the important thing, especially when we turn on to the, the methodologies that you may use, you may do different things for different audiences. It may be appropriate to reach out in different ways to your audiences. They may need different shoes. Um, so think about, think about that as you're building the project. And really everything we're going through now is something that you could talk to if you have an external research agency or consultant working with you, or just, you know, kind of think through with your team to really make sure, because um, the benefit that you get from doing the research is completely reliant on the amount of time and effort you put in setting it up to make sure that you check all the boxes for yourself. So dedicate the time to kind of think about this from a target audience perspective. And of course, think about your budget. Um, so think about how you can get the most for your dollar. Um, there are a few things that we're going to talk about in just a minute that are pretty mandatory, I would say, like thanking people for their time for participating. But there are some other wiggle rooms, like I mentioned before, of any tools that you use in other parts of your organization. Um, you know, are there, are there group meetings that you can leverage? Are there facilities that you have a relationship with that could host an interview? Um, so kind of think about maximizing your resources, but do have a budget and do make sure that you're earmarking it for quote unquote, the right things, like the things that you really need to spend the money for. And I know this is sort of, this is very difficult to talk about on, um, on, gen on general terms, right? Um, so this is probably a specific conversation, but it's just important to think about from that level. Um, actually, Vivian just asked a question that I'm going to answer here because I think it's relevant um, about what if you want to reach out to new people. That is slightly more difficult. And again, that may be a budgetary concern. So since those are not engaged audiences and maybe you are exploring how to get more people in touch with the, the nonprofit or involved in it, um, that may be, need to be where you leverage some budget. So are you buying panel database sample? Are you, um, are you recruiting like we do for projects by you know, using a recruiter or posting on social media to get uh, people to give you input? So I think you know, if you are doing that, it, it, is a, it is a different set of tools and tactics and it's probably gonna be where that budget is going is to try to attract people who are not already engaged to be engaged with your organization for the sake of the project but it's doable good question all right so um i did mention that we were going to do kind of a cold down approach here so you saw a lot of methods that we do as a business a few slides ago um, we wanted to just talk through a few of them that are probably <laughs> easiest to bite off um, if you're thinking about running a study on your own or running a, stu but it, a study on a more limited budget um, and I'm going to turn it over to Sonia to walk through them. Great thanks Katrina. So we'll start off with surveys and this is one of the things that you can do either on your own or working with someone like us. Um, there are a lot of easy and some free tools out there like SurveyMonkey that are, you know, easy to get started on if you don't have a lot of experience um, with the platform. And this is surveys are when you want to use, you know, quantitative data to project results out to like a larger number of people. And they help you, you know, really give engaged audiences experiences they truly want and need, um, and organizations need to know, see, hear, understand, and think what they think. So asking the right questions here will help a lot. Um, it's not one of those things where it's like a conversation where you can kind of change the flow. So a lot of um, prep work is important at the beginning, really understanding what you want to get out of it and working to translate that to questions that you can put into a survey. And we do have a lot of tools that we've used that are available out there. There is a lot of DIY survey platforms like SurveyMonkey that I've already mentioned, but also polling tools, which are very similar to survey tools, um, but they're more like on the spot. So think like if you've gone to a store or something or use like an airport restroom where they're like, oh, how was your experience here today? And you click on the happy face. That's kind of like a polling tool. So you can create something there and ask people um, on the spot 
about their experiences. And another thing that we like is something called omnibus surveys. So this is great if you don't necessarily, you know, have the budget or want to use the budget for one big, huge survey um, where you like reach out to a bunch of different people. This allows you to come up with like one to three questions that you might have at the moment and then kind of hop on to an existing survey um, and the company will you know take care of everything like recruiting and incentive you just come up with the questions and you get the data back basically and another methodology that we like to use a lot here at No are discussion groups and interviews. So AKA focus groups. So you might be familiar with these. Um, you might have participated one or seen them where it's a group of people sitting in a room with a mirror with observers behind the mirror. So we do a lot of those, but um, we've gotten a lot more creative, I guess. Um, as an industry now, there's many different ways that you can do groups or interview discussions. You can, you know, have them in focus group facilities, like I mentioned, but you can basically go to wherever your participants or potential participants are. Like you can have them at their workplace or depending on the project, wherever they might go for to do whatever they're doing. Um, you can have, um, I guess you could also do them via webcam or on the phone. So there's a lot of options to basically talk to people. And so let's see. So consider location um, where you might find people to do these. Um, we find that, you know, it's easy to get really scrappy with a lot of these groups or interviews, especially. Um, so you might want to, you know, consider where you are, right? We've done interviews, you know, on location at like trade shows or at the mall where people are walking by and you can grab them, talk to them for, you know, 10 minutes to an hour, that kind of thing. And also consider project design. So that's going back to where Leanne was talking about objectives, really understanding what your objectives are and what questions you want to ask of people. Once you have that set, then you can really understand or create the methodology you want. Like, do I need to talk to one person and have a really in-depth conversation with them? Or do I wanna to talk to six to eight people in a group to have multiple points of views um, where the conversation might have less depth, that kind of thing. And lastly, we'll be talking about bulletin boards and diary studies. So these are great platforms, um, usually done online. So participants can exchange their feedback with you um, from the comfort of their computer or tablet or iPhone, whichever one they want to use. And digital diaries are great at providing remote access to participants' behaviors, like in the moment. So you might have um, you might be familiar with this where people will be like, oh, I'm at the supermarket and here's a photo of like a cereal box. Like that's what they're doing in the moment. And we're able to respond to them at another time. Um, and bulletin boards are great for group discussion. And so they're also done online. Um, and it's a good way to, I guess, show different concepts to groups of people and have them respond um, as well. And I just want to do a check-in right now. Are there any other questions? You can type it into the Q&A box or the chat box. All right. Okay. Yes, if you have any other questions, just let me know. Otherwise, we will move on. Great. So I'm moving on to incentives. So basically, Incentives, um, what can you afford to give? So Katrina or Leanne mentioned this earlier. So people or participants, as we like to call them, they're really giving their time and sharing their experiences with you. So you really need to uh, show that you appreciate them for what they're offering to you. So I'll go through different types of incentives that we've successfully used. So gift cards, donations, and products. 
So starting out with gift cards, this is one of the most um, popular ways we incentivize con uh, participants and they give them choice and flexibility here. So for example, we've used Visa gift cards and they can use that um, anywhere Visa is accepted. And another gift card we've used is Amazon. So a lot of times um, it's really easy to, after a project, um, enter in email addresses and you know, incentivize participants for their time there. Another way that we've used is donations. So donations offer a very cost-effective way to say thank you to participants. And there's a couple ways to go about this. So the first is asking corporate sponsors to donate something of value to give to participants. And another way is to donate an established monetary amount directly to a sister charity in a participant's name. Um, another way we've seen this done is to maybe give participants options of where they would like to give donations to. That makes it um, a little fun and gives them the choice of where they put their incentive. And lastly is using products or branded items exclusive to your organization. Um, and we find that this is very unique or memorable. And it's a good way to um, be kind of scrappy um, if maybe you might not have the resources to give out a bunch of different gift cards or donations. Um, and for hugs, um, the hugs program, we actually gave out um, purple plush blankets to participants that Lisa's Care Connection already had. And it was a great way of saying thank you to the participants. Um, they were able to hand deliver it to them directly after their interviews. And a way that your organization can do this is to kind of see, you know, what is available to you. So we've seen a lot of organizations use like, you know, branded water bottles or bags or hats left over from other events. Um, and there's usually maybe like a storage closet or you can ask a coworker. Um, we've used that before. It's like, hey, do you have any like hats or something that we can give out to participants for research? And we're big fans of, you know, compiling whatever's there into like a VIP swag bag for participants. So deliverables, uh, this is a really important part of the research. So what's your end game? You've found out all these really amazing things, but um, you still have to decide how you want it shared. Uh, do you, are you going to share it uh, with your team or maybe board members? Who, who is going to find out about all this great research that was just done? So you want to think about um, your budget. All of these uh, come with different a different price tag, uh, but you want to make sure, first of all, you get your, get observers involved, get your team involved. What's, when you're thinking about the team, are they spread out all over the country? Is there an easier way to get this information to them? Um, uh, in a deliverable, you can, you can share raw data. Um, whatever, whatever specifically you want to know, you can, you know, ask for different different things from if you if you use an outside company um, but think about what it is that people want to know and what you've discovered um, so there are reports that you can produce but there are also other um, options like audio and video and i'm going to tell you a little bit more about those so um, first of all, reports. They're just a traditional way of disseminating information. Uh, we do a couple of different versions here, a few different versions. Uh, we have insight summaries, other people, a lot of people call them top lines, but basically they're just a quick way to learn about the overall themes that you hear. Um, you can have a full report and that's a more blown out, robust version. So it, uh, it's usually, we usually do a PowerPoint presentation. We'll have slides uh, with um, 
uh, pictures and we have more quotes from uh, participants. Uh, a lot of times we'll have, if we're showing some sort of um, potential messaging, we'll have the messaging and then some information behind that about what we've learned. So a full report is just a, a real blown out, more robust way of looking up at a, compared to an insight summary. And then um, you also have the options of a video or a podcast report. Now, the thing that makes these really special and different, they're, um, it, it offers a more personal summary um, of the insights. You can uh, see and or, or hear and or see the participants uh, actually speaking about uh, whatever the topic is. And, and you can really get a feel for how much emotion is behind it if you're listening to them or if you see them you can really you get a better understanding of what it is they're trying to say so it also is really uh these are really simple to send out to team members that may not be available then it may not be in the office um they can uh in their free time listen to a podcast as they're driving in and, and you can hear the participants give their thoughts and opinions um, or sometimes if they have time they can sit down and just and really watch and you get the full picture so it's just a it's a it's a more of a full deliverable so to speak so um given all of that i'm just going to interject for equipment that is a lot it is a lot to digest and it varies based on how much in how much experience you have with market research and with insights so we've tried to distill down a few things regardless of what methodology what incentive what deliverable that you've chosen that are kind of guiding lights or tips and tricks across the process to to start thinking about so to pull your team together, start thinking about what you want to learn and how you might um, put together a research initiative. And I'm going to have Sonia walk through the hopefully, what is hopefully a digestible, smaller set of tips and tricks to get you started. Thanks. So the first one is to optimize your database by opting in. So to maximize the participant pool by offering an opt-in button on your website. Basically use your resources that are already there. So if someone's on your website or if they're part of your email list, make it easy for them to say like, hey, I would like to participate in research. And if someone clicks on that button on your website, you can invite them to participate in research or any research um, ongoing. Next is to be creative with incentives. So I touched upon this a little bit before, but if you're enabled, unable to provide an incentive to every participant, consider offering a chance to win a prize. And instead of offering one really large prize to win, consider multiple prizes to increase the odds of winning, thus increasing um, the response rate. And we've used that um, for the survey successfully for the HUGS program. Next is to make your target audience feel comfortable. So depending on the project, you know, some nonprofit participants can be older, maybe they don't have access to technology or are part of an underserved community. So really take into account your participants and who you're working with when determining the kind of methodology and deliverables you want to use. And I mentioned earlier that we used webcam um, to conduct our interviews. A lot of people didn't have access to webcam, so we had to um, be available to use the phone and make it easy for participants to participate. Next is to be creative and pivot when needed. So really be open to trying new tools or out of the box methods, especially if you know your plan A doesn't go the way you expect it to. So there's constantly new services and new products that we've used and that you may be able to use to meet your needs, even if they weren't designed that way. Um, I think we live in a time where there's like so many new like technology and services out there. And a lot of times what we end up using is like, oh, I heard about this new thing. It's not used for research, but maybe we can hack it to, you know, use interviews or, in con or conduct some type of study. And lastly, I will throw it over to Leanne for number five. Um, understanding your participants. This uh, is really important because most nonprofit employees or um, caregivers in our case that we were, we were interviewing with the HUGS program, 
these everybody comes from a place of caring. You're they're working for or volunteering for an organization that they truly believe in. Um, so we uh, they 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 really will offer up deep, thoughtful, meaningful insights. As long as the moderator really respects and shows concern. Um, for their core belief system. And uh, I know a lot of times if you're thinking about budget and you, you know, you're trying to know where to cut, using a professional moderator is something that is really important because moderators understand how to be objective and open, yet really know how to connect with participants to get the most, um, to really let them know that we are listening. So that is something that, that really you need to, uh, to show respect for the people that are really giving their time and, and energy for this. It's really, it's an important piece of the puzzle. And to that end, we very much appreciate your time that you've spent with us today participating in the webinar. Um, we are actually just shy of the full hour, so we're happy to give everyone 10 minutes back in their day. Um, but if there are any questions or what ifs or nuts you'd like us to, try to crack in real time, <laughs> we can take a stab at it. Um, if anyone want, has anything either in the chat box or, um, or the Q&A, um, if not, um, or even if so, we're gonna make the recording available. We will have a PDF of those five digestible tips. Um, we'll have the link to the full video um, about hugs if perhaps you know it is late December and you're interested in casting out some charitable give giving. Um, and so all of that will come to all of the attendees and is freely shareable um, as a thank you and um, as a bit of a happy holidays. So it looks like we are free from questions and we really um we appreciate also thank you marty for joining us one of our lisa's care connection recipients is on the line so <laughs> it was a pleasure marty thank you thank you also for letting us talk about <laughs> your project as a case study um and i think that's it happy holidays everybody yes happy holidays <laughs>